All right, let me, thank, let me begin by thanking the organizers and of course especially Meng Chuan for inviting me to speak. It's uh, been a pleasure to visit Singapore. So today I'm going to be talking about a proposal for non-abelian mirrors. Let me begin by giving a, a thumbnail summary, a, um, uh, the executive summary, especially for those of us who are still grappling with jet lag. So very, very briefly, what, um, and I really am, I tell you. I, I've never seen someone fall asleep in their own talk, but uh, if I stop talking, I, I, it may well happen. Um, so very, very briefly, the idea I want to try to convey is an idea for a, um, an extension of Horibafa's procedure for constructing mirrors. Now, to be brief and, and try to be clear, Horibafa actually did two things. They came up with both a procedure for uh, manufacturing mirrors to abelian and gauge theories. They also had a proof of that procedure. Um, I do not claim a proof. I do not claim uh, any partial progress towards a proof. Instead, uh, what I'm going to present is a proposal for what the answer might be. Um, it looks a little odd, as I'll talk about later, but it seems to do enough things right in enough different cases that it's been worth uh, writing about. So, with no further ado, what's mirror symmetry? Uh, let me back up a few steps now. We've heard a lot about t-duality at this conference, so let me introduce mirror symmetry by saying that mirror symmetry is in some sense a, a generalization of t-duality, a generalization that does not, not bleh, that does not involve uh, having a circle or some sort of S1 isometry on the space. So um, traditional mirror symmetry, let's say, And let me also say, if my writing is too small for people to read, please do uh, let me know. So in traditional mirror symmetry, if two spaces, and when I say spaces, I really mean calabiales, if I'm going to be talking about traditional mirror symmetry, if X and Y are calabial and mirror, then there are a few, well, there are a number of basic properties, but for example, the superconformal super field theory of X will match the superconformal field theory of Y. As a consequence, if the superconformal field theory is the same, then the central charges are the same. So as one, perhaps one of the most elementary consequences, the dimensions will match. Since the Dobo cohomology groups, or elements of Dobo cohomology, correspond to operators in the conformal field theory, the Dobo cohomology groups will match. And in fact, they'll match in a slightly, um, in a well-understood and slightly intricate fashion. Um, the Hodge diamond will essentially flip along a diagonal. HPQ of one will be HN minus PQ of the other. Um, the A model on one will be the B model on the other. And as a consequence of that, uh, the most relevant property of mirror symmetry is that quantum corrections in one will become classical computations in the other one. Now that's great and fine. There's a rich, wonderful history behind mirror symmetry, and most of it will not be relevant for today's talk. What I really want to talk about today is a, um, a slight variation of this uh, worked out by Hori and Vafa, which is really a, a notion of mirror symmetry for gauge theories. And in coming up with a notion of mirror symmetry for gauge theories, that also enables one to make sense of mirror symmetry for spaces that are not calabial. So let me try to take a minute to explain how in the world that works. Um, and in fact, let me take a minute and give an outline of what I want to do for the next little while. So first off, I want to spend some time talking about uh, the projective space and its mirror. And I cannot seem to write clearly on the board today, can I? Um, so this, the, I want to do a few simple computations in, or I want to first define the mirror to a projective space and do a few simple computations in that mirror because those computations will form the prototype for what I'll be discussing later. So that seems like a nice warm-up exercise. Next, I want to review Hori Vafa, which will give me a reason to explain where in the world the mirror I wrote down for this first case actually came from. So then I will present a proposal for a non-abelian extension. 
So again, Hori Vafa uh, is a proposal that works great for abelian gauge theories. Um, it's been an open question for a number of years of how one would go about, whether it's even possible to go about constructing something analogous that would make sense for non-abelian gauge theories. And then once I give that proposal, I want to work through a few examples. Uh, the first uh, example is going to be uh, the Grassmannian, GKN, which will, nat so the natural next step to do after a projective space. Now, if the only thing you could do was a Grassmannian, then this would be an awfully boring proposal. But in fact, the proposal is meant to work for any uh, connected, uh, any two-dimensional, 2-2 two -two supersymmetric gauge theory with a connected gauge group. So as one other example to sort of illustrate the, some of the ideas here, I want to try to talk about, or probably given the time remaining at that point, outline the mirror to an SO2K gauge theory with matter consisting of some vectors and some twisted masses and things of that sort. And at that point, I'm pretty certain time will have run out. So, projective spaces. What is the mirror to a projective space? And for that matter, how in the world can I think about a projective space as arising from, uh, or how can I think about the mirror to a projective space as arising from the mirror to a gauge theory? So the basic idea for why mirrors to gauge theories are relevant is simply the fact that a projective space can be written as a quotient of Cn plus one by C star, which means as a result, that it can be realized by a U1 gauge theory, and I should really say a supersymmetric U1 gauge theory. Everything I'm going to do today will be in two dimensions. All these theories will be supersymmetric with 2-2 supersymmetry. I won't always use those words, but if I don't, that's always going on in the background. So this will be realized by a supersymmetric U1 gauge theory with n plus one chiral superfields, and very roughly we think of the chiral superfields as being something like uh, the homogeneous coordinates on that projective space. Now, uh, and when I say realized by, what I really mean is that this is the Higgs branch, the classical Higgs branch of the gauge theory is that projective space. As a result, if I can construct the mirror to that gauge theory, then in some sense I can also construct the mirror to this projective space, even though uh, it's not actually Calabial. Now the answer to the mirror is something called a Landau-Ginzburg model. Now a Landau-Ginzburg model is something that is defined by chiral superfields together with a superpotential. And that superpotential will define an ordinary bosonic potential along with Yukawa couplings between those various chiral superfields. So here, for the mirror to CPN, there will be uh, the mirror Landau-Ginzburg model will consist of n chiral superfields, which I will label yi, together with a superpotential, some holomorphic function over the space of those uh, superfields which is conventionally denoted W, and in this case will look like a sum 1 to n e to the minus yi plus q times a product from 1 to n, to n of e to the plus yi. Now, let me take a few minutes to explain how in the world that superpotential can possibly encode any meaningful physics of that projective space. And in fact, let me back up one step more and say when I talk about mirrors here, what I really mean is um, uh, well, in most of this talk when I talk about mirrors, what I'm really going to be talking about are A-twisted gauge theories and B-twisted Landau-Ginzburg models. I'll make that a little bit more explicit later, but maybe for the moment I don't need to get into quite that level of detail. So, let's compute. In particular, let's see if we can find the quantum cohomology ring of the projective space lurking somewhere in the classical physics of that Landau-Ginzburg model. That's basically the idea here. This mirror uh, operation should take the quantum physics of the original theory and turn it into classical physics of this Landau-Ginzburg model. 
Well, the bosonic potential is just equal to the norm square of the gradient of the superpotential. So the most useful thing to do is to compute what's called the critical locus, which is just a locus where the derivative of the superpotential vanish. So in this case, that's pretty easy. If you'll forgive me for doing a, a little bit of algebra on the board, the WDI is just gonna be minus e to the minus yi plus q times this product over, let's call them j's, e to the plus yj, and let's set this equal to zero, and what we get then is that e to the minus yi is equal to this quantity, q times a product over j's, e to the plus yj, for all i, independent of i. Now, where does, what can we do that with this? How can we simplify this? Let me define sigma to be e to the minus yi. Then that equation for the critical locus can simply be written as sigma is equal to q divided by sigma to the n, or in other words, sigma to the n plus one is equal to q. Now, I, um, I haven't said anything about quantum cohomology rings. However, I, uh, the quantum cohomology ring of a projective space is fairly widely known. If there's anyone here who hasn't seen it, the quantum cohomology ring of a projective space is a ring in one variable whose relation is precisely x n plus one equals q. So, this equation for the critical locus precisely duplicates the quantum cohomology ring of a projective space. And that's a standard result. That's a standard part of how the classical physics of this landau ginzburg model duplicates the quantum physics of the original gauge theory. And that's a prototype for much of what will happen next. Now, there are lots of other things that will match. The matching isn't just limited to this. One can compute correlation functions in the landau ginzburg model. You'll get the same correlation functions as in the original gauge theory but my time is finite, and I think this acts as a nice lens through which to think about this. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I didn't say. Um, so it's, um, let me come back to that in a couple of minutes. It'll be easier then. All right, so that's the first example. Let me now tell you a systematic procedure for generating examples of this form. Let me tell you the recipe that Hori and Vatha are... Mm -hmm. Oh, because, um, because this is equal to this for all i. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a statement just about the critical locus. That's a, that's a fine question. It's right to the point of what's going on here. So here's the Hori Vatha recipe. Let's suppose you're given an A-twisted U1 to the R gauge theory with matter consisting of fields uh, phi i of charges QIA, where this I is meant to be that I, and that A index is meant to correspond to the number of U1s, 1 to R. So Q is the charge matrix for these possible fields. Then the mirror will consist of the following fields and the superpotential. The fields, first off, will consist of some sigmas, as many as the number of U1s, together with Ys, like the Ys over there, and I'll, I'll come back to your question in, a, in another couple of minutes. Um, yes, as many as the original Phi's, uh, and then a superpotential, which I will write as a sum over A's, sigma A, uh, uh, sum over I's, QAI, YI minus T, plus a sum over I's, e to the minus yi. Um, there are various um, 
um, uh, yeah, subtleties going on. Um, maybe the first subtlety I should mention, for those of you who've seen this sort of thing before, I'm using a very slightly non-standard notation. Um, what I'm writing sigma is conventionally written a little bit differently, um, is conventionally written as a capital sigma, which I have replaced with what is usually the lowest component, a uh, little sigma. This is for the reason that in doing these manipulations, one often encounters quantities like the sum over all a's of sigma a, and I find that particular combination to be somewhat confusing. So for my personal sanity, I'm simply replacing capital sigmas with lowercase sigmas, so that um, um, which works for me, but if you're used to the other notation, it might drive you up a wall. Now, um, uh, the Ys. The Ys have certain periodicities, which gets back to that particular question. The Ys live on a torus. We identify Yi with Yi plus 2 pi i. This quantity T is, let's say, a mirror to a quantity called the Fi parameter of the original gauge theory. It encodes both a, well, a size of a projective, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, yeah. Because I've got the wrong number of fields. Excellent. Oh, uh, uh, I'm about to come back to that. It's a fine question. Bear with me for just a minute or two. Um, um, Ys, Ts, I think that's just about it. So there's a theta angle implicit in those theta Fi parameters. The theta angle has a periodicity determined by 2 pi times the charge lattice, um, but I don't think I need that level of detail for this talk right now. Now, what's the relation to Pn? Let me answer Martin's question. So if I want to build Pn, Pn corresponds to a U1 gauge theory with n plus 1 uh, fields, chiral superfields, but never mind that, phi i. So according to Hori Vafa, I have a superpotential that looks like 1 sigma times the sum from 1 to n of uh, yi. Let me mention these n plus 1 fields all have charge 1. I subtract off a t, and then I have a sum for i from 1 to n plus 1. Um, then I have a sum over i's of e to the minus yi. Now, ah, let me skip over here. Now, the usual trick to derive this sort of superpotential is to first integrate out the sigmas. So, step one, integrate out the sigmas. That gives a constraint that the sum over i's from one to n plus one of yi is equal to t, which we use to solve for one of the i's. So let's solve for y n plus 1, which will be t minus a sum i from 1 to n of y i. And then if I plug back into the resulting, uh, into the hori vafa ansatz for the superpotential, what I get is, well, formally, a sum from 1 to n plus 1 of e to the minus y i, which now I'll write as a sum from i equals 1 to n of e to the minus y i plus e to the minus t times a product from 1 to n of e to the plus y i. And this e to the minus t I'll identify with q. So I think that answers your question. All right, let me pause for breath and see if anyone has any questions about this. OK, good. Now. Here's the proposal for how to extend this to a non-abelian gauge theory. Ah. Mm. 
Hmm? Sorry? That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, proposal for non abelian extension. Yeah, that's right. So this this whole order waffle mechanism can be applied to any any Fano space. We'll get some weird Landau Ginsberg model. Um, these aren't going to correspond to superconformal field theories unless the gauge theory is describing a clavial. But you know, still, you can make sense of this, and you'll get a Landau Ginsberg model that encodes quantum cohomology relations, correlation functions, and um, uh, people like Iguchi have been playing with this for years. So I'm sure they can he can give you a list of other things this will produce. Huh? Um, can you consider the a twist of this Landau Ginsburg? I want to rephrase your question as saying, can you compute the a twist of this Landau Ginsburg model and get a b twist of this? So um, uh, the first uh, the first thing I should say is that that would only be possible for very special world sheets because the b twist of this. The B twist of a projective space usually doesn't exist unless your world sheet is flat, unless you're working on the complex plane or something like that. Similarly, there's an obstruction to making sense of the A twist of this Landau Ginsberg model. And that basically gets to the heart of what you're asking. But on those very special on very special world sheets, one could consider that. And to be honest, I haven't thought it through. Um, I would assume that the answer is yes for special world sheets, but I honestly don't know of any particular examples. It's not something I've ever spent any time thinking about myself. All right. So, suppose now we're given an A-twisted G-gauge theory where G is connected. And for simplicity in this talk, I probably also want to say simply connected. I think we have some basic handle on how to deal with simply connected versus non-simply connected cases, but just for simplicity, simply connected With matter fields, in some representation, I will simply denote rho. Then the proposal for the mirror takes the following form. There will be fields, sigma a, a from one to r, which I'll take to be the rank of g. There will be yi's for i from one to the dimension a row, basically one y for every field of the original theory, you know, just multiplying out the elements of the dimension. Um, and then in addition, we'll add some further fields, which I'll label x mu twiddle, where the mu twiddles correspond to non-zero roots of the Lie algebra of that particular group. And the super potential, as follows. So a superpotential that will look like a sum over a's of sigma a times a sum over i's of rho a i. I'll explain, I'll explain the notation in a minute. Let me just get all this stuff down. Minus a sum over mu twiddles, alpha a mu twiddle, uh, log of x mu twiddle is the way I really want to write this to make this clean. Uh, minus t plus a sum of rise, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Ah. Plus the sum over i's, e to the minus y i plus the sum over mu twiddles, x mu twiddle, and then if I have twisted masses, I could add a term for that, but I don't think I want to bother for the moment. All right, in this expression, rho AIs are meant to be the components of the weight vectors corresponding to any given matter field, and similarly, the alpha a mu twiddles 
are meant to be the components of the root vectors, the root vector corresponding to x mu twiddle. And the yoga, the, uh, the way I personally remember this ansatz is that this is abelian duality in a cartan torus. By which I mean, formally, I'm not claiming this should be taken seriously, but formally, if one were to go to some generic point on the Coulomb branch, Higgs the gauge group down to a, an abelian subgroup, and then apply Horivafa's duality to both the Ratter fields as well as the W bosons, the result would look like this. And, and there's one other thing I'm forgetting, which I should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, it plays a smaller role than one might think, which is to take a vial group orbifold of this whole thing. So the proposal is really a vial orbifold of a Landau-Ginsberg model of this structure. The YIs are assumed to have the same periodicity as over here. Um, the sigmas are essentially as before. The only new fields really are the Xs. Because formally the W bosons are, no, sorry, the X's are twisted, car the X's are just like the Y's, they're in the same thing. So the Y's should be twisted chirals, so the X's are also twisted chirals. And the, the reason this is consistent with the yoga is that the W bosons should be ordinary chirals. So the trick is not to confuse the W bosons with the sigma fields. The sigma fields would be the uh, twisted chirals at the are ordinary chirals of R charge two. So the fast the fast way I remember that I mean there's uh, people there's a paper there's at least one paper I can point you to where this is explained in more detail. Um, the the trick I remember for remembering the distinction is that uh, is I imagine just taking an ordinary say SU two gauge theory with an adjoint. I Higgs the, use the adjoint to Higgs the SU2 down to a U1. The W bosons are going to be charged under that remaining U1. Now, if the W bosons, uh, if the W bosons were in twisted chiral, rep uh, twisted chiral superfields, then under a U1 gauge symmetry, I would multiply those twisted chiral superfields by exponentials of a chiral superfield, since the chiral superfield is what will parameterize the gauge transformation uh, since chiral superfields would, per, would parameterize this gauge transformation, if the original SU2 gauge theory were, uh, you know, if the original adjoint were in a, sorry, I'm too tired to say this coherently, but it's, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. This is, this is an old, it's a, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, that's right. So this superpotential and the original Horivafa superpotential, um, this is really a twisted, uh, uh, twisted, exactly. But everyone tends to just call it a superpotential instead of a uh, twisted superpotential because, you know, life is too short. Yeah, that's exactly it. Even for a simple gauge group, oh yes, sorry. Uh, these will be redundant. Let me give you an example. Uh, but uh, yeah, so let me do. Uh, let me describe the Grassmannian, or at least outline the Grassmannian, because I think that will outline, or that will answer some of these questions. So for a Grassmannian, uh, so previously I utilized the fact that the projective space could be written as a global quotient of CM plus one by a C star. I could think of, a, I could realize a projective space as a U1 gauge theory with N plus one chiral superfields. Um, for Grassmannians, there is an analogous trick. Mathematically, the Grassmannian is a quotient of CKN by GLK, which means physically, this can be realized by 
a UK gauge theory with, uh, let's say, n sets of uh, chirals in the fundamental representation. Now, once I present it as a gauge theory, I can now ask, what should the mirror to that gauge theory be? So I can turn the same crank, and what's going to happen? Actually, before I turn the crank, let me mention a couple of facts that will be useful later in thinking about the Coulomb branch of uh, this particular uh, two-dimensional, two-comma-two two supersymmetric gauge theory. Suppose, for example, you want to come, so the Coulomb branch, the, um, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with GLSMs, uh, the, uh, the, the vector multiplet in this uh, supersymmetric gauge theory contains an adjoint valued field um, whose lowest component is typically denoted by the sigma, in fact, coincides with that particular sigma. So along the Coulomb branch, what I mean by that is I've given that adjoint valued multiplet a generic vacuum expectation value. I've higgs the UK down to a U1 to the K. So I really have a collection of sigmas, sigma one down to sigma k. And if I ask what the vacuo of the theory are, the vacuo are defined by the following two constraints. First off, sigma a to the n for each a is equal to up to a sign, which I'm keeping track of because I'm uh, reading the wrong papers, um, which is ultimately being computed from the uh, low energy effect, uh, from the twist of one loop of, uh, effect of super potential, never mind the details. And there is a second constraint, which will be important later, which is that sigmas do not collide. So the second one, um, the second one is particularly interesting. It defines what later I'm going to refer to as the excluded locus on the Coulomb branch. And then combined with the fact that I need to take an SK orbifold of this whole thing, um, these conditions are, the solutions to these conditions are going to correctly count the possible vacua of this two-dimensional gauge theory. Now, let me outline the mirror and start computing. So first off, let me list the fields. I'm going to slightly change notation. So I'll first have sigma a's as before, where a now runs from one to k, since k is the rank of uk. I will have a set of fields I will denote yia. Previously, I just called them yi. Now I want to distinguish a flavor and a color index. So i runs from one to n, a runs from one to k. So altogether, there are n times k of these particular fields. And then for the x's, instead of some weird mu twiddle, I'm going to write x mu nu, where uh, mu and nu uh, both run from one up to k. So mu is a color index just like a, and for whatever reason, I decided not to call it a. The super potential then looks like a sum over a's, sigma a times a sum over ib, rho ib a, y ib, minus a sum over mu not equal to nu's, uh, alpha a mu nu, log x mu nu minus a single t. There's only one fi parameter since there's only one overall u1, as Jacques mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, plus a sum ia e to the minus yia plus a sum over mu's different from nu's x mu nu. Um, the rows of the weight vectors uh, which in this case is just going to be delta A, B, independent of I, since I is just a flavor index. And then the root vectors, alpha A mu nu, I will take to be minus delta A mu plus delta A nu. And now we can start doing some computations. So let me fiddle around with that super potential and see what we get. In particular, let's see if I can derive these conditions for vacua as the critical locus of that super potential over there. So as before, well, first off, let me simplify the thing. I'll write the super potential as sum over a's, 
sigma a is times the sum over i's of y i a, taking into account the fact that the weight vectors are just chronic or deltas. Then I'll have a sum over nu's different from a's of logs of ratios x a nu over x nu a minus t plus the sum over i a's. Uh, forgive me for doing this algebra on the board. It's just um, a lot to write out. Now, um, the next step is to integrate out the sigmas. That will give k different constraints, each of constraints of the form that this is equal to zero. Just as before, um, we can solve that constraint by eliminating y and a. That'll be minus sum i from one to n minus one, y i a minus the sum nu's different from a's, logs of ratios x a nu over x nu a plus t plus, yeah. Um, and then for later convenience, I will define capital pi a to be the exponential of minus y n a, which is gonna be q times a product i equals one to n minus one, either plus y i a times a product nu over nu is not equal to a of x a nu over x nu a. So the super potential now, uh, has the form, uh, let's see, sum over i's from one to n minus one, sum over a's from one to k, e to the minus y i a, plus a sum over mu's and nu's different from one another, x mu nu, plus a sum over a's from one to k of capital pi a. Let me pause for a minute and compare this to the mirror to a projective space. For a projective space, there were no x's, and there was only one term like this, and also no sum over a's. But if you delete this middle set of terms, and take into account that there's only one of these things, then the result should look a lot like the mirror to a projective space, as it should, since a Grassmannian is essentially a generalization of a projective space. Um, before going on to uh, compute the do more to compute the critical locus, make another observation. There is something here that I'm surprised Jacques hasn't given me hell about yet, which is that, uh, okay. <laughs> this thing has a pole, which bugs the hell out of me, but on the other hand, may, may also be a required feature of a mirror of this form. So I don't have the time to go into all the details, but uh, note, let me say um, pole at, x a nu equal to zero. However, for reasons that I can explain later, uh, the mirror map relates x mu nu to minus sigma mu plus sigma nu. So this thing has a pole where the two sigmas collide. Now that's a point where in the original gauge theory one has an enhanced gauge symmetry. So on the one hand, intuitively, I expect the mirror, at least in this framework, to be doing something slightly wonky. Um, in addition, there's also the excluded locus. In order to get the right physics in the mirror, I need to exclude points, the original gauge theory basically excluded points where the sigmas collided. And the fact that there's a pole in the superpotential at the mirror of the point where the sigmas collide certainly duplicates that result. Um, so it's a lot to take in, but let me keep running along with that in a minute. My point really is that that pole is the reason why this part of the vacuum equation is duplicated. I still have to explain where in the world that comes from. Now, it's, 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 um, clearly I'm a fan of alliteration. Um, it is, uh, let's chat later. So morally, I agree. Um, a pole just means the bosonic potential is diverging there, so that just means physics should never ever reach that point. On the other hand, for reasons, uh, for reasons of um, uh, alliteration again, um, 
for for reasons I, for let's chat later. Let me just leave it at that. Um, I think uh, maybe the best reason is simply that historically we only ever worked with Landau Ginzburg models that are polynomials in fields that don't actually have poles anywhere. So a pole in a Landau Ginzburg model superpotential is at minimum not something that one usually works with in these models. And so at minimum, one needs to worry very carefully what physical subtleties may be arising as a result of that. Um, yeah, you could. So oh, yeah, so if your point is, if I understand it, is let's take x, let's do a change of variables, right? x is e to the minus z. And then the problem apparently goes away. So on the other hand, uh, so this is closely analogous to the relationship between what's sometimes called the V-plus model and uh, a compact hypersurface model in GLSMs. It, it's, um, you know, I, it, it will give the same correlation functions if you do the change of variables correctly and take into account extra operator insertions and correlation functions. Um, in the case of the V-plus model on a compact hypersurface, uh, there you actually got slightly different physical theories as a result of making that change of variables. So it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a slightly subtle business. Let's chat more later because otherwise I'll spend my limited remaining time just. Which I have not written down. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, five or ten minutes left. Okay, so I've told you where this part of the equations for the vacuum will come from. I haven't told you where this comes from. Let's see if I can very quickly outline that. So that comes from simply computing the critical loci. Um, and maybe in light of time, well, let's see what I can do. So we still have to actually compute the critical locus of this particular theory. So briefly, if I compute the derivative of the superpotential with respect to the y's, remember the critical locus is derived by setting all the derivatives equal to zero. Here I'll get something like e to the minus yia plus pi a equals zero, which means e to the minus yia is equal to pi a independent of i which is much like what we saw for an ordinary projective space. And when I compute dw dx mu nu, this is one plus pi mu minus pi nu over x mu nu. And setting that equal to zero implies that x mu nu on the critical locus must be minus pi mu plus pi nu. So uh, one consequence is that On the critical locus, since the x's are just those differences, this product of ratios of x's, x a nu over x nu a, that figured into the definition of pi a over here that appeared when we integrated out the sigmas, uh, this thing is just going to be a sine. This is just going to be minus 1 to the k minus 1. So that equation for pi's simplifies. Um, ah. I could really use more board space. Sorry, let me continue over here. So, that means each, so that on the critical locus, pi a is simply q times a product, i from one to n minus one, of e to the plus y i a, uh, times the product of the ratio of x's, which just generates a factor of minus one to the k minus one. Furthermore, on the critical locus, each of these exponentials is a pi a. So this is equal to minus one to the k minus one times q times a product i from one to n minus one of one over pi a. And doing a little bit of algebra yields pi a to the n is equal to minus one to the k minus one q, which is exactly right to duplicate that. And one can also track through how the mirror symmetry acts on the various fields, and one sees that in fact, 
the pi's really are mirror to the sigma. So not only do these equations look the same, but they're actually literally mirror to these statements about the original A model theory. Um, I am close to out of time. So in a nutshell, this is where the, how to duplicate the quantum cohomology ring of a Grassmannian from this proposed Landau-Ginzburg mirror to a Grassmannian. One can go on to compute correlation functions, and those also match. But for lack of time, I'm not going to try. Oh, uh, or, or or redundant's the wrong word for a U for for a UK gauge theory. There's only one FI parameter, as you know. So. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I misstated it. It's not, that they're, it's, it's not that they're redundant. It's not that you necessarily have that many. It's just that in trying to write down an expression for the super potential, I just left open the option of having, you know, I said the gauge group was connected and simply connected. I, well, mm, mm, simply connected. Um, okay, I, simply connected is not the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the usual number of T's. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's, it's the number of T's is not the rank. It's it's yeah. It's just for in trying to write down a, an expression, I just wrote uh, as many T's as that. Okay. I'm I, I'm just about out of time. Let me just quickly outline. Uh, what the mirror to an SO theory looks like. I mean, this is fine and dandy, but if all we could ever do is Grassmannians, this would be an awfully sad proposal for a non-abelian mirror. So let me see if I can just very, very quickly, in the two or three minutes remaining, outline what the results look like for the mirror to an SO2K gauge theory with n vectors and twisted masses. And I also will turn on a, leave open the option of turning on a, uh, um, a discrete thin angle. So here, in the A-twisted, uh, I'm almost out of time. Let me write it and then I'll uh, explain. So in the A model theory, um, let me first tell you about the vacua. There's a more complicated excluded locus than before. There are, the sigma a's have to be different from the twisted masses. And then in addition, the sigma a's have to be different from one another, also up to signs. And then the Coulomb branch relation, I can't really talk about a quantum cohomology relation because there's no weakly coupled geometry I can go to. But um, there's still a, a, a something that morally would be a quantum cohomology relation, except the name is wrong, so I'm calling it a Coulomb branch relation. And it looks like a product one to n of sigma a minus m triple i is equal to q, and I'll explain q in a second, times a product i equals one to n of minus sigma a minus m triple i. The q reflects the possibility of turning on a discrete theta angle on this two-dimensional theory. Um, these results, I should say, came out of a paper Hor uh, Kentaro Hori wrote back in 2011. Um, the Q is either plus or minus one. So Q is not some continuous parameter. It's, it's, it only takes on those two possible values. Um, Kentaro often restricted one value of Q in order to only consider theories that he called regular. Uh, the mirror proposal works at, at the level we understand it for both regular and non-regular theories. So I'm just retaining uh, both possible values of the discrete theta angle. Um, and if anyone's really curious, I can happily work through all the algebra. Um, 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 since I am just about out of time, maybe I should simply say that one can repeat the same ansatz as before. Um, the poles in the superpotential will duplicate the excluded locus. The critical locus will duplicate these Coulomb branch relations. Um, and one ends up with a, after integrating out sigma fields, one ends up with a superpotential that looks even more disgusting than the one for the Grassmannian. But the point is that in principle, all of the quantum physics of the original A-twisted gauge theory 
gets re-encoded as classical physics of this two-dimensional Landau-Ginsberg model, um, exactly as advertised. So not only does this proposal work for Grassmannians, it also works for other gauge theories. In the paper we wrote, we tracked this through for every example we could find in the literature. So there are results for SO2K, SO2K plus one, um, you know, SPN theories, uh, uh, all of that. Um, plus I had a couple of grad students who, in my opinion, needed to better understand Lie algebra representation theory, so I had them work through the same exercise for G2, F4, and the exceptional groups. Uh, just, um, you know, the, as an excuse for the problem to solve itself, as it were. Um, okay. Um, there's more I can say, but since I'm about out of time, this seems like a natural place to stop. Um, you know, on the face of it, the non-Bailey nature of the gauge group, it's not obvious to me how to extend that. Um, naively, it, to doing so looks like it would be an exercise in non-Abelian t-duality. So maybe the good answer to your question is simply my ignorance. Uh, one would have to trek through non-Abelian t-duality and whatnot, and I don't really know how to do that properly. Um, I'm, I'm suspicious, though, that even if I did, uh, you know, that said, I mean, the actual, the actual route taken here, the, the form of the onset suggests this would not be derived from necessarily going that route, but from doing something like, again, it sort of pains me to say this because I'm not, well, uh, formally, uh, my suspicion is that the way to derive this particular result would be to do something like go to a generic point on the Coulomb branch, uh, Higgs the non-abelian theory down to an abelian theory, and then apply Horivafa within that abelian theory. Now, I'm not going to claim that that necessarily, you know, I, I, I am absolutely not claiming a proof. I am not claiming we have really tracked through those details. We're just based on the form of the result. I mean, the result looks like uh, a Horivafa mirror, uh, just with extra fields that are counted in the same way as you would count the W bosons. Um, Okay. Fine with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, in fact, even Ask me later. So I, in fact, there, I, there's quite a bit I could say. I have no time in which to say it. Let's chat after the talks. I think that's, that's the best answer. Um, yeah.